All right, let's go ahead and continue with chapter four, part number five. We're looking at Rome again, and we're looking at civil wars. And look at these statues. Look at these old white guys, right? And all these white guys, they're all upper class. They're all patricians. They're all generals. And they have commissioned artists and sculptors to make sculptures, sculptures and statues of themselves. And they tell the sculptor, this artist, make me look young, make me look handsome, give me a full head of hair, or put, you know, uh, leaves in my hair that you see up there. And the reason they do this, the reason they do this is because they want to be remembered as great men. And they feel that as great men, they need to save Rome. Because Rome has gotten so big, so fast, that now the Roman government, the Republic, is just not really working as it once did. Because the Republic was perfect when it was just you know, controlling Italy. But now Rome has expanded over all over the Mediterranean Sea. And you have senators coming from far, far away. You have senators arguing with each other. You have the government not doing anything. And you have the people suffering. And these great men that you see in front of you, they're going to save the Republic. But how do you save it? Well, you have to lead it. You have to take charge. So you have to kill people and take over. So Rome is going to have a lot of civil wars for a while. And these great men are going to fight each other until eventually this guy will win. Julius Caesar with some cool golden hair or golden you know, leaves in his hair. So all these wars that were fought, all these civil wars, right? Whether it was by these generals called Marius and Sulla or Caesar and Pompey or Antony and Octavian, right? They're all military generals. They're all super popular. And more important than anything else, the soldiers love them. Right? Because, for example, when Caesar, when he invades Gaul, he conquers France. Right? He tells the soldiers, all this land that we conquered, it's yours. You get to live there, you become a landowner. And the soldiers are like super happy. Or when Sulla returns home from conquering people, Right when he enters the city of Rome, right, you have all these crowds waiting for him, and he's throwing coins, silver coins, gold coins, free money to the people. Right, so they become like celebrities, they become like super famous celebrities. The people love them, the soldiers love them, right? And then they say, Look, I'm so popular, I'm so awesome, I'm so cool, I should be in charge because the Senate is great. But we need a leader. We need someone who makes the tough decisions. We need someone who can make Rome great. And these generals think that they're the guy. That they're the one who could lead Rome into greatness once again. And the overall winner of all these civil wars is this guy, Julius Caesar. Right? Lots of paintings made of him. Lots of statues made of him. Plays movies, TV shows, like William Shakespeare wrote plays about the guy, super famous guy. And he wins. And he centralizes power. So he comes in with his army and he tells the senators, I'm in charge. And if the senator said anything, well, you know, he has soldiers to shut him up. Not only did he have the support of the soldiers, he has support of the people. We call him a populist because he made the people love him. And one of the things he did was that he offered them games and bread. So imagine you're like this poor person in Rome, right? You don't have a job because you got fired because you got replaced by a slave. So you don't have any money. So all you do is sit around. You're hungry. You're bored, right? And then Caesar comes to power. And he says, we're going to celebrate Rome's awesomeness. And we're going to have two weeks of games. And now you get to go to the Colosseum, you get to watch chariot races, you get to watch uh, gladiator fights, and it's all free, totally free, you don't pay anything, free entertainment. 
And then the food that they sell or the food that they offer is free as well. The government gives you bread and you get to eat and you're not starving anymore. So imagine how popular Caesar was, right? And his laws, his rules, right, were backed up by the military. So Caesar says, you know, Rome needs to be saved and I'm going to be the savior. And he says, I'm going to be the dictator for life. Now, dictator to the Romans wasn't as bad of a word as it is now for us. Dictator meant protector, right? And in fact, there had been different dictators in Roman history, right, during times of emergency, right? Like if Rome was under attack, then they'll pick one guy to be the dictator and he'll have all this power. And then uh, after that emergency was solved, right, that guy would give up his power and go back, you know, uh, to his regular job. But Caesar says, I need to be the dictator for life because Rome is under constant threat, internal threats, external threats. Rome is always in a state of emergency, so he needs to have all the power to fix all the problems. And the end result is that the senators, the tribunes, the assemblies, right, all the republic government, right, they all lose power because now Caesar could pretty much do whatever he wants. And with the people and the military behind him, he was the dictator for life. So the senators, there's a group of them that decide that we can't let this happen. We cannot let this one guy control all of Rome uh, because he's going to act like a king. And remember, the Romans, long before this, they rose up against the Etruscans and overthrew the Etruscans right? because they did not want to live under a king. They did not want guy to have so much power. right? They built the whole republic with checks and balances to avoid a Julius Caesar coming to power. But now he has the power, so what are they going to do? They're going to kill him. They're going to stab him 17 times. And Caesar dies, right? And now we have a power vacuum, meaning that who's going to be in charge now? Who has, is the senators going to rise up and reestablish the control? Or is someone else going to come in? So we have another civil war take place, right, between the people who supported Caesar, right, his supporters, and the people who killed Caesar. So now they're going to fight it out. And eventually, these two guys will win, right? This is Julius Caesar's top general. His name was Mark Antony, like the singer. And this is Caesar's grandson, grandnephew, I mean. His name is Octavian. And these two guys will team up and they'll get revenge for the assassination of Julius Caesar. And they get revenge and they win. They win the war. They win the next round of civil war. The problem is that both of them, you know, Antony and Octavian, they both say, I should be the next Caesar. I should be the next ruler. I should be the next dictator for life. And they both claim the title. So, of course, another civil war breaks out. This time between Octavian and Mark Antony. And in the middle, we have this woman. As some of you might have guessed, this was Cleopatra. And she was nicknamed the Whore of Rome because the Romans hated her because she was one of Caesar's many wives. He had many wives. And she was the queen of Egypt. She was a pharaoh. In fact, she was the last of the pharaohs. But she was not Egyptian. She was actually Greek. Because her family, called the Ptolemies, were one of the major families that supported um, Alexander the Great. And after Alexander's death and the breaking up of the empire, uh, her family was awarded to rule over Egypt. Right? The Ptolemies, or the Ptolemaic kingdom, ruled over Egypt. So uh, she was first with Caesar, and then he died, and then she got up and hooked up with Antony, and both of these wanted to rule. And the Romans hated her because she was not Roman. She was Greek, and she looked like an Egyptian, and that's horrible to the Romans. So these two are going to fight it out in a new civil war, and we're going to find out who wins in their next video.